the title of my talk is um, Pareidolia and the uh, Biocognitive Semiotics of Religious Anthropomorphism. I think I can unmask myself according to the local protocol. So uh, first, a little test. Uh, I'd like to ask you please to concentrate on the central image in this slide. Um, it is not very visible, but you can uh, probably um, have this little exercise with me. And um, try to identify what you see in this image uh, in or post-structural semiotics, uh, uh, we would say that uh, I would uh, encourage you to lexicalize uh, what you perceive in this image. Um, your answers to this exercise are probably very various, but uh, if I flip the image um, upside down, uh, then we are all probably going to reach a consensus. Um, it's going to be very hard for you not to identify the profile of a bearded man, of a bearded old man in this cloud. So, as I was saying, so the, the point is that so when you um, Flip the image upside down again. Um, well, again, it is going to be impossible for you not to recognize the same visage uh, in the uh, image that I first presented to you uh, with the first orientation. So this means that uh, in the first image, there wasn't a general consensus. You could not all recognize the profile of a bearded man. In the second image that I had the right orientation, uh, you actually had, you were compelled to recognize this profile of a bearded man. And uh, if I return, if we return to the first image with the same orientation, then there too, you are compelled to find the same image uh, with the same classicalization, the uh, profile of a bearded man uh, in the upside down image as well. So this is a um, common phenomenon in uh, the perception of faces, uh, which is called the pareidolia. Um, it is interesting to us from um, many points of view. Um, first of all, because it tells us that there is something in this plastic structure, the plastic structure that uh, underpins this image that um, compels us to recognize a figurative element. There is a certain disposition of the drops of water that uh, pushes us to see uh, the profile of a visage. Um, so it is interesting to ask whether this element that compels us to recognize a visage is a cultural element or is a natural element. Um, the answer is probably that it is both. It is a natural element because there is a mechanism, a cognitive mechanism in our brain that compels us to recognize a face in this visual configuration. But at the same time, it is a cultural element as well because we do not only recognize a face, we recognize a bearded face, and probably we recognize or we might recognize in this plastic configuration the profile of a deity, of a divinity, of a god. Um, this image
uh, was taken by a photographer working for BBC, uh, and it was then uh, combined with a text entitled Neptune seems to have made an appearance on the East Sussex coast during a storm. The sighting of the face of the Roman god of water was captured by BBC photographer Jeff Overs in New Haven on Tuesday. He took the picture as waves crashed over the harbour wall during the storm. The sighting seems to be an example of pareidolia when an image is seen in an otherwise random or ambiguous visual pattern. Mr. Overs said he took the photo at about 9 BST at high tide in winds of more than 50 MPH, 80 kilometers per hour. It's become a popular location for photographers because the sea boils in high wind against the sea wall. The waves splash into the high wind and when blown back occasionally make caverns that look like pareidolic gaulish faces. Um, where is the cultural element? Well, if the photographer had been a Chinese photographer um, depicting or taking photographs of the gigantic uh, um, river waves that um, hit uh, uh, the estuary of uh, Shanghai, probably he wouldn't have recognized the same deity, he wouldn't have recognized the beard, but he would have probably recognized the face. So there is a combination here of something in our brain that uh, pushes us to recognize the face and someone, something in our culture, in our memory, in our language that pushes us to um, attribute further uh, connotations to this face. So um, it is interesting to uh, combine the point of view of uh, cognitive sciences, the neurophysiology of vision, uh, but also cultural semiotics uh, with the um, um, uh, physics of the waves, in particular a phenomenon called dispersion, which is uh, very important uh, in, at the center of the modeling of the so-called uh, raw waves. Dispersion is the mechanism where a system decomposes into simpler systems, each of which moves in a different way, and the overall effect is to render the system decoherent. All the while, energy is being conserved and the dynamic is time reversible. Yet, this often leads to the system simplifying over long periods of time. This is different from dissipation, amplification, and friction. The physics and mathematics of dispersion has been applied to the study of several natural phenomena, among which waves, and in particular rock waves, that is, unusually large, unpredictable, and suddenly appearing surface waves. Rock waves are currently object of active research and evidence is accumulating that they can appear in any medium, including in liquid helium, in quantum mechanics, in nonlinear optics and in microwave cavities, in Bose Einstein condensation, in heat and diffusion and in finance. So dispersion might actually be a central dynamic in order to understand how complex configurations might emerge from random interactions. Um, including um, these complex configurations that visually emerge in uh, visual pareidolia. So this is another um, uh, example of religious pareidolia. It, the Jesus um, um, face is the face of Jesus appearing on a toast. And this toast in particular was the object of an article uh, published in 2014 by a group of um, Canadian neuroscientists of Chinese origins, seeing Jesus in toss, neural and behavioral correlates of face pareidolia, which has actually won the um, uh, IG Nobel, the Alternative Nobel Prize for bizarre research uh, um, uh, attributed by Harvard University. So what is the um, uh, main content of this article. Uh, this article claims, and it is already uh, an old article published in 2014, that face pareidolia is the illusory perception of non-existent faces, and this illusory perception is actually rooted in the brain, and in particular in an area of the brain which is called the right fusiform face area which is the area that um, um, compels us to recognize faces, even if faces are not there, uh, even if just visual configurations that are similar to faces are in the environment. So uh, I would like to uh, 
combine this uh, knowledge uh, with another trend in the history of religion, which has been religious sciences, which has been inaugurated by this book by Stuart Guthrie called The Faces and the Clouds, a new theory of religion. Uh, the theory is that maybe uh, some religious cultures originally um, um, uh, were uh, generated by a paranoid phenomenon. So um, there was something in the human brain that compelled our ancestors to find visual meaning in a random configurations, in configurations that were actually created through physical dispersion. And, um, and that was the origin of um, most anthropomorphic religions, according to, to Guthrie. Now, there is some uh, 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 evolutionary evidence related to the uh, development of erect position in uh, the ancestors of the Homo sapiens, and in particular, in the evolution of human uh, bipedalism, which began in primates about 4 million years ago, or as early as 7 million years ago, uh, with the uh, ancestor of the uh, sapiens called Saela Anthropus about 12, 12 million years ago with the news Guggenmosi. So uh, what is interesting to, to point out is that this erect position that was first developed by this particular um, stage of our evolution um, basically had a series of consequences on the way our ancestors used our um, head muscles, and in particular, the head muscles of the forehead that were not used in order to sustain the head anymore. It wasn't necessary because the posture was almost erect. And they were then adapted to other means, the means of frowning, for instance, the means of communicating. So our face became a sort of a screen for other beings of the same species. Um, this particular stage in the human evolution uh, coincided also with the human possibility to first stare at the sky and at the clouds. Um, our predecessors before the stage would actually go around like this, but then from the stage on we would go around like this. So actually look at the sky and look at the clouds. So at the same moment in which we were able as uh, uh, members of the species to look at the clouds, we were also able to uh, liberate the face from uh, um, other functions and to use it as a screen in order to communicate with our beings. And then uh, last stage, sorry. Um, I wanna uh, end up with this uh, very recent study, which has just appeared in Frontiers and Synaptic Neuroscience uh, by a group of scholars um, published in 2021, Synaptic Framework for the Persistence of Memory Engrams. Um, what is an engram? Um, well, um, several studies have demonstrated that the excitability state of a neuron affects its probability to be allocated in an engram network. Furthermore, a transient learning-induced increase in excitability of engram cells is thought to mediate the linkage of experiences that occur close in time through co-allocation of engram cells. So this article basically says that um, if you first do not recognize the face in the cloud because the configuration is upside down, and then I turn the image and you actually recognize the face because the configuration is in the right plastic disposition, then a sort of an engrammatic structure uh, takes place in your brain that is going to be the source for all uh, sort of subsequent memories that will use the same engrammatic structure. So this was a little bit too complex to condense in 20 minutes, but my contention is that um, semiotics has been interested a lot in uh, um, the study of grammar, grammatic study. Uh, we should probably combine that with an engrammatic study. There is a grammar that takes place in, um, in the uh, formation of our memory that takes place in uh, the um, constitution of our visual memory and that ultimately 
has played a very important role in the uh, uh, progressive structuring of human cultures, including the imagination of uh, divine faces and um, their role in religion. So um, this is more than I had expected, sorry. I talked, uh, I think, for 17 minutes, but I'm um, um, very pleased to answer your questions, if any. Thank you very much. So we started at 12.10, I talked for 17 minutes, so we have more or less, uh, like half an hour for our speak for each speaker, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, so we have 13 minutes if you want me to go more in detail on some of these passages, which were very uh, quick, I realize, but uh, I'm, I'm ready to uh, interrupt with you, but I, I think I should also, as a chair, have a look at the chat. You must I think you need to share the screen. Okay, no, that's okay. So you're um, welcome to ask questions also through the, through the chat. Sure, I can ask the question to myself, of course. Maybe too easy. Yeah, thank you, uh, Massimo, for this a very interesting presentation which uh, gives a, a, retrospective, um, respect, a retrospective insight into uh, our interest in the basis. Uh, I have two questions. Um, you said that there is something that um, governs our perception of the census, cultural knowledge, etc. Would you say, would you call those legislators? That's the first question. And the second one, I was wondering whether you think that uh, it would be relevant to have a look at the way newborns interact with the faces. Because you also explained a bit the anthropological development. So I was wondering whether that would be relevant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, by the way, this is my um, project in Turin, it's an ERC um, consolidator grant project that I have the pleasure to lead at the University of Turin. It's called Facets, and it deals with all sorts of questions concerning the face. Uh, most questions are local, you know, concerning digital cultures, uh, representation of faces, but I'm really interested in, in, in at this stage, uh, about big questions concerning the face and its uh, human development. And uh, <clears throat> I feel the need to combine semiotics with a lot of other uh, disciplines, including neurosciences, uh, including evolutionary biology and so on and so forth. But I, I believe that semiotics is probably the most versatile um, meta language that we can adopt in order to create a, a bridge between all these uh, knowledge fields and, and research fields that proceed uh, separately from each other. I mean, uh, scholars who work on the transformation of the use of the forehead in evolutionary biology uh, do not necessarily have a knowledge of uh, how that might have impact in, impacted in the social interaction among our ancestors in the past. Or those who study the uh, synaptic uh, condensation of memory do not necessarily work on cultural memory, uh, let's say memory outside of the brain. So, um, and uh, to be more precise about your question, um, all the knowledge that we receive from um, the sanitations of the past is very precious and uh, first, for instance. But at the same time, they were producing insights, um, being um, completely, um, um, let's say, ignorant about what came after in terms of developments in knowledge in neurosciences. So their intuitions are very, were very valid in many cases and are still valid. They probably can suggest as a name for some processes that we haven't named yet. Uh, but of course, I think the the exchange must be uh, mutual. I mean, um, it is not only necessary to recognize pairs in modern, let's say, in neurocognitive sciences. It is also necessary to recognize modern neurocognitive sciences in pairs. So not only give old names to new phenomena, but also to give, uh, let's say, new names to all phenomena. Um, and, um, and certainly there is a lot of research about uh, the um, perception of faces in uh, 
um, um, newborn babies and even in babies uh, that uh, uh, who haven't born yet you know there are some experiences uh, of um, um, uh, pregnant matters on the wounds of which a, a triangular shape uh, made with sounds is projected so that actually the, the baby inside which hasn't born yet has an impression that this triangular image is forming within the womb of the mother and uh, it has been seen with twins for instance that when one of the twins is exposed to this triangular shape has a sort of a switch of attention that the other is not meaning that probably the um uh, right fusiform area of the brain that uh, encourages us to direct our gaze immediately toward the face is something that is uh, created even before the baby actually sees the face of the mother. Yeah, thank you very much for your answer. And this uh, kind of the need to have a broader perspective on the phenomenon and how they appear. You're welcome. Um, Thanks, that was really interesting. I was thinking about your proposal, if I understood it correctly, that anatolian phase can be um, sort of the origin of religious belief. And I was thinking, why not patterning more generally? Because, in a sense, um, we are inclined to see patterns everywhere, not only in faces, but uh, we have even. Uh, areas devoted in our brain devoted to recognize the typographic pattern, for example. So, why not simply say that the tendency there was in perceiving the world as not running, as having an organization and then can organize them? Yeah, thank you. This is a very good question. Because, I mean, if you follow the thesis uh, as it is proposed by this book, um, uh, God's uh, Faces in the Clouds, uh, then you couldn't take into account the emergence of religious cultures uh, in um, uh, civilizations that do not actually uh, anthropomorphize deities that, that do not actually attribute a faith to gods. Um, in uh, most, uh, many uh, non anthropomorphic uh, religions, there isn't this attribution of a faith to, to deities. So deities cannot be recognized. But there is something more interesting in that hypothesis, which I would call the engrammatic hypothesis. Um, it is as if there were some areas of our brains that are specialized in certain pattern recognitions, not, not all pattern recognitions. And one of them, which has been studied a lot, is exactly the part of the brain that is um, uh, specialized in, in face recognition. Now, the hypothesis is that actually that area might um, have been played a, a significant role in creating, um, well, in the brain, a sort of an engrammatic structure. So somehow our ability to recognize faces in the environment was the basis in order to structure other memories that were not necessarily memories of faces, but were related to memory of faces. Um, so um, it is as if there was in our brain a hierarchical structure in which uh, uh, some pattern uh, are used in order to uh, create and grammatic networks that then can host a whole bunch of subsequent memories. Um, and the, the challenge is to try to see whether this is um, the case not only at uh, a level of the formation of our individual memories, but also in the formation of cultures. I, I'm not talking about archetypes, because uh, if you go into that direction, then you dig into um, a certain knowledge that was very popular in the 20th century, uh, Jung and other scholars. Um, I'm talking about uh, some evolutionary features of uh, our species uh, that then created a certain disposition toward personal memory and language that then, as a consequence, uh, inflected also the way in which uh, human beings created culture together. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, is it already me? Can you hear me? Uh, Can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can. Maybe it's more of a comment or kind of peripheral to your talk, um, because but you know because I come from uh, Buddhist philosophy. Um, you know, you mentioned that um, the change induced by um, human beings becoming erect. So you have this, you know, um, orientation up and down. If we speak in terms of cognitive semantics, like Lakoff and Johnson. But you know, I was wondering, what about the metaphor of inwardness? Say, when you close your eyes to the world in order to um, avoid um, perceiving stimuli. So this is more, you know, like about silence and. Uh, don't know whether that plays any role in you. Oh, thank you. You know, this is a very interesting question because uh, there is um, a, a certain impact um, um, by the fact that um, um, most of our senses were actually uh, concentrated in um, the face. I mean, the ears, the mouth, the nose, the eyes, they're all in our face. Uh, it's only the touch that is distributed elsewhere, but otherwise everything is, is in the same uh, spot of our body. At the same time, this body is invisible to us, so we cannot actually see the place of our body through which we perceive the world. And that is also a consequence of the evolution of our face. On, on the one hand, all the um, organs through which we receive sensations from the environment were concentrated in one spot and at the same time this one spot was made by evolution invisible to us um, and uh, that has certainly generated um, all kind of you know cultural consequences among which the fact that we can be sure that for instance our face is the human face that is not an animal face which has been, I think, an important question in the evolution of the human species through interaction with other human beings, um, through being recognized by other members of the same species, or through representation, uh, through rudimental forms of uh, mirroring. Um, but also the fact that we can actually um, uh, have a voluntary interruption of sensory um, or stimulation uh, only with reference to certain senses and not to others. You know, the fact that uh, uh, we must receive um, um, a sensory stimuli from our ears or through our ears, uh, because our ears do not have ear lids, but we have eyelids, so we can decide not to see, but we cannot decide not to hear. That has had a lot of consequences in uh, in the history of human cultures, including religion. I mean, uh, Saint Paul used to say "ex audito fides," uh, so the, the faith comes from the ears, exactly because the ears cannot, you know, voluntarily rest to an object of sensation. But you know, this discussion should be probably continued further on another occasion because we are eating up the time for the next uh, presentations. So I think uh, we're like time for this uh, talk has finished. Thank you very much for your questions. And uh, I give the floor immediately exactly to the person who was asking the question before. So Alina Therese Lettner, we have little time. So I think it's better that we present ourselves through our work. So without uh, information about uh, our affiliations or what we have done in the past, but we just concentrate on what we have to say. So the talk is uh, entitled About this the Model of Semiosis, Perception in the Sign of Three, Sense, Object, and Consciousness. And um, Alina Therese Lettner, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. So I'm sharing the screen. Um, so can you hear me all right? And is the screen okay? Yeah, the screen is okay, and we can uh, uh, hear you. We can we can hear the screen, but probably I can also make your yeah face visible. Right. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So, um, first of all, thanks very much to the organizers. Organizers, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm quite impressed how well this um, hybrid conferencing actually works. So, okay, without further ado. Um, the topic of my talk is um, a Buddhist model of semiosis, perception in the sign of three, sense, object, and consciousness. So um, this really brings together two broad areas, which is the question of semiosis and uh, theories of perception. 
And this is due to the fact that um, in Buddhist terms, perceptual cognition um, really requires three different factors. So it requires a sense or a sensory faculty, it requires an object, and it re requires consciousness. Now we're going to look at this um, in more detail. And um, oh, by the way, I just wanted to say um, my slides are very detailed, but the idea behind this is that maybe we can look at some of the aspects um, during discussion time. So, um, right. Um, yeah, we know this, I think this should be well known um, that Peirce's conception of semiosis involves three correlates, um, the represent common, the object and the interpretant. So I'm not going to read out the famous sign definition, but um, what is going to come in handy is um, the definition um, Peirce gives of semiosis. So as an action or influence, which is or involves a cooperation of three subjects, such as sign, object, and interpretant. Now, of course, I'm not expecting anything like um, direct um, equivalence or even parallel, but in the Buddhist scriptures, and I'm going to tell you what type of Buddhism um, I'll show you in a moment, but let me just start out by saying that in the early, even in early Buddhism, in the Pali Canon, um, you already have this idea of three aspects coming together, Innam three, Sangati coming together, and Paso, this is the Pali term. We will see the Sanskrit term, Barsha, which really means, um, which is often translated as contact, but which really comes from the root uh, sprush to touch. So we can see the significance of the body there. So, um, and what is important to say is, so I'm speaking about semiosis and um, perception. So the, the, the reason for this is that in Buddhist philosophy, um, and in particular in Abhidharma Buddhism, um, the way consciousness is understood to operate is really uh, by means of perception. So sensory cognition is really central. And um, I'm including this um, overview. It's actually a simplified sketch of philosophical posi positions of Indian Buddhism. And we don't need to look at all those details. So we have the lifetime of the Buddha. And um, I just mentioned the early um, Bali Buddhism. So we have those three baskets of Buddhism. And Abhidharma Buddhism is really this sort of uh, systematic literature, which is often um, called uh, scholasticism, where you have, which basically involves uh, philosophy and psychology. And um, we're going to look at Vasubandhu's um, Abhidharma Kosha, Bhashya, Bhashya meaning the commentary or the commentary, so the treasury of uh, the Abhidharma. I won't go into this, but Vasubandhu is actually a linking figure with the later so called idealist philosophy of Ugachara. This would also involve various questions. But so the, this is the main work um, on which I'll be drawing. And uh, what he does is he gives us the view of the Sarvastivadins, which is um, a Sanskrit expression, Sarvam Asti, all exists. And this refers to the dharmas. So here the doctrine is that they exist in past, present, and future. And we're going to see what this means um, later. Um, but uh, the work uh, then actually Vasubandhu really favors the Sutrantika view, those following the sutras. We will look at this later. So um, this is Dharma theory. And just to take a look at the central term um, Dharmas. So in the plural, these are really minimal uh, phenomenal events or constituents of experience. So this is really like physical and um, psychic flashing um, in experience. So they uh, arise and then they are gone once again. So it's this change all the time. So um, how is perception being theorized by the Savasthivadins? And what is central is the so-called theory of the sensory basis. And we've got this sketch here. 
Um, and uh, so the first, we, I've mentioned the three factors. So the first one are the sense, it's the sense organ, the sense accuracy. And here, here we've got um, the Sanskrit terms for eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. And the sixth sense um, is, an, is a, a cognitive faculty, which is mind. And corresponding to these, so it's very systematic and Indian philosophy in general likes classifications a lot. So what corresponds to these are um, the, the various objects. So for the visual sense, you would have color and form, rupa, then you would have sound, odor, taste, touch, and again, mental objects. And so the basic idea is that you really need those three factors in order to uh, for perception to take place. And it's usually put that way that um, when you have a sensory organ functioning well, coming together with the um, corresponding object, then the um, corresponding consciousness arises. And to give a very concrete example, or oh, sorry, when you um, perceive, say, perceiving an orange, what you would have is, so the object in this case could be something like a patch of color, orange color, and then you have um, the sight organ, the visual sense, and in the end you have visual consciousness arising. But of course, this is just, uh, this is very similar to sense data or qualia. So you would have a patch of color, but of course you would also have something like a round shape or a distinct smell. And the Buddhist idea really is that in the end, what we get is um, a rather subjective combination of those data. And they are combined into a macroscopic object. And um, in Buddhism, um, there is really a soteriological relevance uh, of seeing things the way the, they actually are, yatha bhutam, the way they actually become. So this sort of conceptual um, superimposition, kal, uh, the kalpana, kalpana um, this is really distorting our perception of reality. So this is really um, important for liberation. Um, we could speak about this in more detail, but um, okay, we don't need the whole sketch here. It's just um, the important thing is how do we, what about the human being and uh, so-called, um, you could say that uh, human empirical personality is really theorized in terms of um, five, um, these are the favorite five aggregates, bunch of standards. But these aggregates, so they are kind of the um, they are heaps of the dharma. And the important thing is these are really classes of processes. And we basically have a physical material pole. So what, what could be translated as matter, but rupa is really something more like sensorial materiality. Um, and uh, as for the mental pole, then you have um, like Vedana, these are kind of the hedonic modalities. When you, the first reaction of perceiving something as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, um, this kind of links body and mind, you could say. Um, and um, we, we will look at this later for when we deal with um, perception. So Samjna uh, would be like to, uh, to speak in Persian terms, like this aspect of habit or recognizing something as something. This is where concepts come in and actually it opens up a whole web of um, con con um, conceptualization and associations. And in the Indian Buddhist also some stardust, which is Ganda number number four, which are which is really a free translation that Last House in Buddhist phenomenology uses is like this is really something like embodied conditioning. So through various experiences, there is a sort of um, reciprocal causality or feedback processes between um, cognitive action and the experiences that have already accumulated. And this is, of course, uh, includes many unconscious processes or also evolutionary in inheritances. So we could also look at this in more detail, um, but um, the now uh, turning to semiosis, again, I have mapped um, 
the Abhidharma Buddhist model on uh, the Persian triad. So basically, we've already seen uh, the sensory basis. So um, I have put the senses, uh, this would come here with the representation and like feeling, potentiality, firstness. Um, then um, as for the object, um, in Buddhist theory, you would speak of the object cause, so the patch of color, this um, what we call the object vishaya, in this case would be um, understood as the uh, object causing the cognition. Uh, and consciousness is the third factor. So I would assume something like a basic parallel between um, the arising of awareness as this is being understood in Buddhism and Persis Semiosis. So that, so Sparsha, that is what was Passo in Bali before. So the meeting of these three factors. And then um, we uh, will need for aneroscopy, Persis aneroscopy will come in handy, his phenomenology. Yesterday we already had a marvelous introduction to Persis aneroscopy by Davida Costa Silva. So I can abbreviate this, but basically what we have to keep in mind, so a uh, feeling, this initial feeling, Vedana, and a perception, Samjna. We could really, um, this is what um, profits from being looked at uh, in terms of a step from phenomenon to sign, as uh, Andre Dutien um, has described it. So we start out with something like spanerol manifestation, awareness, and end up with the thirdness of semiotic representation and all that it involves. So um, it has to be isolated. So the phaneron has to be isolated from the stream of manifestation. So you have this aspect of separation when you have an object and the object is named. So um, this is actually and where you know the contrast between ego and non-ego would come in. I could say uh, we could look at Buddhist phenomenology. So I really work with uh, Last House's Buddhist phenomenology. And um, here he shows us the Abhidharma beginnings, but then he really deals with the Yogacara, this later movement, which is really Buddhist phenomenology par excellence. But even like the main scholastic activity of discriminating dharma, um, so we have very long dharma taxonomies. I've got an appendix, so we could also look at uh, take a look at that. But basically, the idea is that discriminating dharma. So this is kind of the theoretical counterpart to meditation practice. So now I'm coming to the second main. Oh, Point so the question of semiosis because now we have this background of perception theory, and so the question now would really be: Can the operation of dharma be considered as a something of a functional equivalent to semiosis? And so, how do those uh, dharmas work? So again, we look um, at the theory of the Savasivadin, um, which takes things or actually dharmas to be existent in past, present, and future. And so what this means is we have something, uh, we have two planes, basically. We have dharma svabhava. So when you translate that literally, sva, self, and bhava, it's the same root, by the way, like, uh, as bhu, to become, so self-nature, or own being. And um, sometimes you find um, problematic translations like um, self-essence. So um, um, when we compare this, you know, I've also compared this to Aristotle and the definition of logos. And um, so this would actually, doing intercultural philosophy, this is quite interesting. But just focusing on Buddhist philosophy now. Um, so um, these would be, so uh, the, this sort of being is not eternal in the sense that there is no change, but it's more like um, it really refers to potential appearances of dharma into phenomenal existence. So this would be like person's firstness or um, spontaneity, creativity, potentiality. And on the other hand, the concrete manifestations, so person's um, secondness, 
um, these would be the dharma lakshana, so the momentary manifestation. And actually, um, efficiency, causal efficacy is really central um, because um, this has to do with what is accepted as being real. And real is not something like a reference, say, when I say actually something like an orange because it's a macroscopic object, but real is only when you do something like a vertical deconstruction, you reduce it and then you get um, something like uh, ontological ultimates, so minimal constituents, and they are understood as being causally um, efficient. So, okay, so then we could look uh, into this with regard to Peirce's um, pragmatist theory of thought time. And um, let me just ask, how many more minutes do I have left? Uh, three minutes, uh, yeah, and then 10 minutes of, uh, for discussion. Okay, perfect. So I'm actually wrapping up things anyway. So um, let me see. Now, looking at the question of agency or action so um in, in a buddhist sense uh, a moment would be actually defined as that where um an action is accomplished and i think this ties in quite nicely with Peirce's uh, understanding of the interpretant or the interpreting act which consummates the agency of the sign and again returning to a phenomenological reading or phenotropic um, um, working with Ransto, whom I find very useful. So he stresses that with Perth, um, we really um, have a step from the philosophy of mind to semiotics, or what has been called step from spirit to the code. So agency of interpretation is really located in the process itself. So it's, um, yeah, so it's really quite useful for describing um, all those non-anthropocentric non um, uh, processual aspects of um, Buddhist understanding of agency. So I will just, um, yeah, for summing up, we can say so consciousness is understood as a compound phenomenon and consciousness is really just a conventional name for a chain of conscious moments. So you see the parallel to semiosis, and then we could say a lot in detail about consciousness. So the preceding moment of consciousness acts as the basis of the following one. And then, uh, since I hinted at that, we have different um, approaches in Buddhist philosophy. So either you say that there is a similarity of form between consciousness and its object, or we could go very much in detail there. But in any case, so the most important thing is that you don't have anything like an agent or a permanent self, but you really have, um, it's, it's rather described as you have dharma, so you, so you don't have like a substance that is qualified, so consciousness is not a substance that is qualified by its mental concomitants, but it's really more like it, um, an enveloping. And as the final slide, let me leave this. So this is what I already um, uh, cited, in, quoted in the abstract. So what does awareness do? Actually, when we have an act of perceptual cognition, na kinchitaruti, it does nothing. So this is really the main idea. It's an arising of awareness, but no agent. And yes, thank you very much. I think I'm going to leave it um, at this. Thank you very much. We have uh, 10 minutes for for questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, I, please go ahead. I don't know if you, thank you. Hey, Melina, Sally. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, Paris, but I uh, wanted to ask about the um, uh, three periods of time. Um, so, if uh, things are existent in the or seem to be existent in the three uh, periods of time, past, present, and uh, future, uh, what is the uh, role of memory in this approach? And if it's discussed there, 
Hello. Thank you. Yes. Um, actually, that's a very good question. Um, let me think. I actually, I go back to the to the relevant slide. Okay. Right. So, um, there would I'd only scratch the surface, and there would actually be a lot to say about time as such. So, the most important thing would be that um, time um, really is nothing like an eternal substance, but actually it only consists in these um, dharmas, the way they are happening. And you asked about memory. So, basically, even later when we come to the um, epistemological, the logical epistemological school of um, the Buddhists like Ignaga and Dharmakirti. So all these um, mind activities like memory, they are actually all distorting. So um, I can't give you any concrete examples from the text now because um, this would kind of would have become too detailed. But basically, this is this is distorting, even though. Um, you know that in Sanskrit, you know, terms always have many different um, connotations. So smriti, um, yeah, we would also need to look at when it means awareness. But you know, I could not quote any. I would really need, need to look at the text. But we could actually do this. So if we stay in conversation, I'd be happy to just look this up and give you more concrete examples. Thank you. Thank you. And any other questions from the audience? Well, I have um, a couple of questions uh, myself, if you don't mind. Uh, very fascinating. Um, there was a historical contact between Peirce and, and Buddhism uh, that is related to the fact that uh, Paul Karras, who was the editor of Purse and was the founder of the journal The Monist, was also the one who hosted uh, uh, Deitaro Suzuki, who was the uh, Japanese scholar who introduced Zen um, philosophy to uh, the United States and uh, uh, translated many, many Zen classics and Buddhist classics into, into English. Um, so uh, there, there was probably even a an encounter between Suzuki and Perks in those years, uh, as there was between Dewey and, um, and Suzuki. Um, so um, this encounter was problematic because somehow Zen philosophy presented by Suzuki was presented as an image then um, for um, uh, the US audience. And um, the translation of text was not uh, very easy. But um, Transpandus Persandus Paris in Collected Papers uh, 1673 wrote, uh, he responded, the supreme commandment of the Buddhist or Christian religion is to generalize, to complete the whole system, even until continuity results and the distinct individuals well together. So, I mean, it was a reference uh, uh, to Buddhism, but it's interesting that Peirce would call, I mean, would refer to it as the Buddhist to Christian religion, because the, the element of three that is so prominent in, in Peirce was probably also a consequence of his own Christian theology that is, uh, you know, um, a little bit dismissed by scholars of Peirce, but uh, actually had a fundamental role in shaping his uh, triadic imagination. Yes. Um, thank you. Actually, I was going to quote this passage as, as you were asking. <laughs> so thanks very much. Actually, just to uh, just to mention another quote, um, Peirce also um, at some point, you know, speaks about the sense of awe with which one uh, regards Gautama Budo. But um, yes, so the triadic aspect, I think we, we could speak a lot about um, the historical development of categories and why it's three categories. But and and I know there's also um, there's also actually an investigation of um, Christian Trinity and Persis uh, three categories. Um, I, I would need to check the name of the author, but I have to be quite frank that I have been more interested in you know um, working out um, developments that really um, you know look at commonalities between. Um, Peirce's understanding of the universe as a reasoning process or like as a as a whole argument 
what is what is the right quotation you know working out its conclusions of god so you know you have this theistic um aspect there but i think like at the deep structural level you would find a lot of commonalities working with pragmatism and i think you mentioned william james so um in in a volume in which i recently published something on um in which i published something on pragmatism and signlessness there are also contributions on mystical pragmatism so um yeah i must say that i personally was more interested in these um deep level correspondences but if you look for those um quotations and historical uh contacts you you will definitely going to find something but i don't want to speak too much because we still have a question by the persian scholar Iago, so. <laughs> if there are any other questions from, uh, from yes me? yes i would like to ask a question and also make make some make some uh uh appointments um i'll try to be very brief not to eat up the time uh thank you alina for your very interesting paper i have the, i have had the pleasure to 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 read some of your papers and i am i, I am a, a a bit acquainted with with your line of 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 inquiry but i have to say i am very ignorant in terms of buddhism so i will concentrate more in the in the in the in the elements that i can relate to and i i can for example give some hints as how to uh, maybe uh, put this in a in a broader perspective and uh, this i'm saying also out of my own ignorance in terms of Buddhism, but I really ha do have the feeling that you have uh, you were in the possession of a uh, of a very important, you know, a very interesting system of uh, uh, phenomenology and semiotics in in your hands. And it's interesting that you 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 identified the, the parallels between this uh, Oriental line of inquiry with Peirce's line of inquiry because they have the, the, the many similarities. Mm -hmm. And uh, my idea would be, for example, from the aspect of, uh, of Peirce's inquiry or better stated from the inquiry of uh, perception and phenomenology and also including semiosis. And one really important aspect of, of semiosis, which is uh, the change of habit. Not, not, not every sign will get to be interpreted in another sign ad infinitum. There will be a moment in which a symbol is, because it's characterized as a symbol, an argument, it will render a change of habit. And this is, uh, this is something also very important. So my, my hint would be first, perhaps uh, you could uh, extend your presentation in terms of uh, in terms of Buddhism in this length and organizing in a form that we can see the the, the, the reader of your pa future papers and I hope I do hope that there will be a lot of them that you that you can change you can uh, um, you can present to your to your um, uh, readers uh, this passage but from the side of uh, sign, side of Buddhism, and of course, there uh, it will do this the same with 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 Persis philosophy, and I think this parallelism will uh, will help mutually to disclose many interesting insights, both of Buddhism and and and, and also in terms of Persis philosophy. And I I, uh, I can follow up this uh, your 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 uh, the interplay that you are you are uh, proposing here, and I think it's very very fruitful. In the, in the sense that you can present those both systems. I, I see those both systems with you very ready to be presented in a, in a long range perspective. And this, this, this would be my, my hint for the, my, my tip for the, for, for the next productions. Only one uh, aspect I would suggest you, uh, for example, Joseph Ransdell, um, he uh, he's a he's a, a wonderful semiotician, one of the first of the maybe the second generation of of great semioticians and and, and also a student of Peirce. 
uh, with whom I had the pleasure also to to have many conversations early in back uh, back in the early two thousands. And but he has um, one aspect that I do not concur with, which is to bring too much proximity between phaneroscopy or phenomenology and semiosis itself. And in many an occasion, he uh, tries to push together the qualitative aspects of the sign as phenomenology itself. And this is not quite right because there is a space. And yesterday I tried to show in my talk, there must be wow, an, a, 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 a already over time two minutes. Okay, so if, if okay sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, we can we can go over it then later. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you for, for your presentation. It's very, very fruitful and interesting. And as an ignorant in Buddhism, I would like to, to see more of the, of the functioning of the, uh, uh, of the, of the system in a, in a broader perspective. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for being short in the discussion. Alina, last word, very short, please. There, I just keep this very, very short. So thanks for all the kind and uh, instructive comments. Um, I just want to say, you know, I always have to see a middle way uh, because, you know, to just pre present too much of Buddhism, I think this is already quite a lot. But one of the main ideas of my work is really, you know, to, as I've called it, following Hans Lenk, to impregnate um, Hertz's methodology with Buddhist conceptions. So I'm really trying to refine them because Buddhism offers such um, a richly nuanced um, vocabulary uh, regarding the inner realm. So I'm doing this and okay, thank you. So um, phaneroscopy, perception theory, I think I'm going to send you my latest publication and then we're going to continue uh, speaking about this. Thank you. <laughs>